Thank you, Anne. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me? So as Anne mentioned, I left Northern Ireland. That was 22 years ago when I was 22. So I'm officially neither here nor there, and I think my accent is also somewhere in between as well. So if you're at the back of the room and can't hear me, feel free to raise your hand and say, speak up. Uh, so thank you to MassQ and MASCD for inviting me here today. It's, it's a privilege and an honor uh, to speak with you. Uh, I always love the opportunity and challenge of a keynote, uh, particularly for this group, because you know probably the least effective way for you to learn is for me to talk at you for the next 45 minutes. So it's incumbent upon me to sprinkle in a little bit of interactivity today as well. I'm also going to leverage a little bit of technology. I know we've got a lot of technophiles and uh, techno experts in the room, so I want to make sure that we leverage that expertise. Our framework uh, for today, I thought we would ground it in three questions. The first question is, what's worth learning? I think any large-scale uh, large school or district change needs to be grounded in that question. And I have liberally borrowed that question from David Perkins from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Many of you might be familiar with his work. It was one of my favorite graduate courses back in 2006, and I still remember the four questions that that course uh, was grounded in. What's worth learning? How is it best learned? How can we get it taught that way? And how do we know what has been learned? So right there, that course really articulated the four questions that I think any school or district needs to ask itself. And what's worth learning, how's it best learned, how can we get it taught that way, and how do we know it has been learned is basically curriculum, pedagogy, teacher development, and assessment. And those are the, those are the biggies. And when it comes to change, there needs to be alignment across the entire system with regards to the answers to those four questions. So I always like to ground this talk in what's worth learning. Secondly, uh, what needs to change? Given the fact that what, what's worth learning is different than what it was back in the 19th century when the system was originally designed, what needs to change to make that possible? And then finally, the big question, how can transformation be enabled? So those are the three questions that we're going to uh, work through in these next 45 minutes. And as I mentioned, I'd like to build in some interactivity as we go here as well. So capturing the knowledge in the room, making the thinking visible, as it were. Uh, raise your hand if you're familiar with Padlet. Fantastic, OK. The learning curve here is minimal. So if you could go, please, to the link that you see there. Uh, if you go to my Twitter handle, at uh, Julie Margretta, and you should see the clickable link to go to Padlet. And you should see something like this, depending if you're on your laptop, your mobile device, of course, it'll be a, a smaller screenshot that you're seeing. But I'd love you to take a moment and answer those first three questions. So the first one is, what works when leading change in schools? There's a lot of expertise in the room. Shelley told me she was expecting anywhere from 200 to 250 people here today. In my mind, that's at least 1,000 years of knowledge. So we want to make sure we capture that. So what works? What does, not, what, what does not work? What doesn't work when leading change in schools? You might have been the victim of that. You might have been the unwitting participant in that. What does not work? And then what are your questions, your big puzzles, as it were, when it comes to leading change? And your answer to, those, to that third question will help me frame uh, some of what I'm going to talk about. I can sort of gloss over some slides and go a little bit deeper in others once I get a sense of the room. There's also a Q&A with me after this keynote, so that, that column will also give us some fodder. And let's see what we have here. OK. I'm starting to see some definite themes here. Uh. 
Okay, so keep, I'll give you another minute or so to note your thoughts in those first three columns. Also to give you a heads up on the fourth column, I've got a bunch of additional resources to which I will refer during the next 45 minutes. So if you're interested in those, please put your email address in that fourth column and I'll send those resources to you directly. But for now, let's just focus on those first three and note your input. Once you've noted your input, then scan up and down each column because I'm going to ask the larger group here what are the themes that you see for each of these three questions? So let's look at the first question. Scroll up and down your colleagues' responses there. What are you seeing as far as themes? What works when leading change in schools? What themes are you seeing? Feel free to shout out. Shared vision. Yes, collectively, where are we going? A shared vision, what else? Listening. Listening and listening and listening some more. What else? Buy-in from staff, yes. Are you forging a vision and then you turn around and find nobody behind you? The buy-in from staff. Transparency, yes, thank you. Time. Say more about time. Mm -hmm. Yes, so people move at different paces and your initiatives will move at different paces. And you really want to make a balance of initiatives that are moving forward at a clip and that are having an impact and that you're gathering some data and the flip side, which is trying to boil the ocean and doing too much too quickly, and then getting change fatigue. What else are you seeing as far as themes with regards to what works when leading change? Modeling what you expect. Modeling what you expect, yes. I do a lot of work working with teams, helping them be more cohesive, and all it takes is for the leader to have a sidebar conversation with another person, that's under the heading of gossip, to undermine maybe six months of work. You need to lead the way. And that can be difficult sometimes. That can be difficult. Anything else for what works as far as a theme? As you scan up and down the list of what you and your uh, colleagues have written there. Collaborative Say it again. Collaborative leadership. Collaborative leadership, yes. We've got Lorenzo at the back of the room here. I strongly, strongly encourage you to come to his session if you want to see how that's done. Lorenzo will, will guide the way there. Collaborative leadership, yes. This is not a solo act. Okay, so let's go to the dark side. What does not work when leading change in schools? What does not work? Ah, yes. Shiny blue ball syndrome. Somebody read a book over the weekend. Now we're doing this. I was uh, listening to a podcast with Jim Collins on the way here, and he said he received an email one time from an employee who said, my, my leader has uh, read level five leadership over the weekend and says he's a level five leader, help. <laughs> yes, initiative fatigue, what else? What doesn't work? So too, too many changes at the one time. What else? What does not work? Top down, Top down. yes, because I said so. It works up until a certain point when you're raising children. <laughs> and then when it comes to adults, it's, you know, not so successful. Not so successful. Making assumptions, yes. Uh, I used to teach a class maybe 15 years ago on project management. And it was fascinating doing it with intact groups. Because one of the first things I would do is get them to, each person would take a piece of flip chart paper and say, okay, write down all of your assumptions about this project. And maybe there were 12 people in the group. And it was fascinating. And usually the next hour was spent with the leader debunking all of the assumptions that people had about the project. What else does not work when leading change? What does not work? Maybe 
Too many things at once, yes. Too many initiatives and then trying to do it all at once. Oftentimes, whenever schools have a strategic plan, it can be tempting to try and do all things at once. But in my mind, it can take anywhere from three to seven years, depending on the depth of what it is that you're trying to do and accomplish. Anything else for what does not work that you see as a theme? From what? Pardon? Not having a shared vision. Yes, not having a shared vision. I would go a step further in saying, and say not having a shared sense of what the problem is that we're trying to solve. Because once you get clear on the problem, then that opens up a myriad of possibilities. But if you're locked into quotes one solution, then it can oftentimes be a, be a butting of heads. So let's switch now to the third column. What do you see as some of the, the themes with regards to the puzzles and challenges that you share in this room as you lead change? This will help me steer some of the content. Yes. Time and money. Resources. Yes. We have the triple constraint. Time, quality, and cost. Pick. Your fast, cheap, or good. Pick two. What else? Collective bargaining unit. What else? Mm -hmm. Helping people not fall into bad habits, yes. And it's amazing how as adults, just the inertia of the status quo, even for something that you want to change yourself. I remember maybe six years ago, something as simple as I moved from a PC to an Apple laptop. I wanted an Apple, so, you know, and I wanted the uh, functionality. I had that laptop uh, for six months and my PC on my, on my desk for the same six months. And I was using the PC more than I was the Apple. It wasn't until I stripped the PC, donated it, that I actually started using the Apple. Just the inertia the status quo, the pull of that 19th century system. What else for big challenges? Knowing what change is necessary. And what else? Irritability and patience. Yes, why can't we just get this done? Why is it so difficult? Well, let me break it down to you how we can change a system based on compliance, consumption, and control to one of creativity, autonomy, and risk-taking. That's going to take some time. That's a cultural shift. That's not just we're going to do a new program, and now we're going to implement it. Okay, so thank you for your input. This will be available after, after the session, so you can continue to uh, gather those pearls of wisdom uh, from your colleagues. And as I go through uh, throughout my comments here, Please do feel free to note down your email if you'd like me to forward any of the resources that I'm going to reference uh, during, during this talk. So I mentioned grounding, grounding this in what's worth learning. And this is one woman's highly biased view of what's worth learning. I've worked for 20 years at this point in adult development and helping, uh, helping leaders lead change. And about 10 years into the work, I started to notice a theme that kept recurring, particularly in the one-on-one -on -one coaching and helping leaders lead and coach teams, which was that so much of what we were doing with them was helping them unlearn what they learned through a standardized system of education. So that brought me back to K-12, and I assumed that because I had left high school many, many, many years prior, that things would have changed. They had not. And that then sent me on an odyssey of finding out who was doing the work that was really leading the way and identifying and really digging into this question and doing the work of what's worth learning. And you're probably familiar with this phrase. Well, let me ask for a show of hands. Has anybody heard of the phrase VUCA? A few folks, yes. So this speaks to a, a term that was coined by the military that we live in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. So the command and control structure of the military was no longer up to the task on the ground, because the conditions were changing moment by moment. 
And the business world since took this, and HBR wrote an article, and then, of course, it hits, it hits the mainstream. But this, I think, is one of the central challenges and opportunities of the education system, which is that you're preparing children for an unknowable future. You are developing persons of tomorrow. And you're equipping them to not just survive in this, in this world, but to thrive in it. And I've noticed over the past decade or so, there's a growing consensus with regards to what's worth learning. You might have read Tony Wagner's book, The Global Achievement Gap, been one of the 40 plus million people at this point who's have seen uh, Sir Ken Robinson's video on changing education paradigms. You might be familiar with Hewlett Foundation and their work on deeper learning, uh, the partnership for 21st century skills in DC, and then my own, own thoughts uh, on the question. As you scan those columns, there is much more consensus than there is difference. So the big question then becomes, how do we transform a system that's basically grounded in language, logic, and recall to help children build the skills, knowledge, and habits of mind that will help them thrive in an unknowable future? And I love this quote uh, by Eric Hoffer. I think this, if there is a, a central theme here, it's the ability to learn, unlearn, and relearn. Another one of the courses that I loved at the, uh, at the Harvard Graduate School of Education was Robert Keegan's course on adult development. And back when he started his work, it was generally understood that you know, once you've, you're done with college, you're pretty much done as far as adult development goes. And his research showed that, no, that was, that was far from the case. And he talks about the five stages of development. Childhood, adolescence, socialized mind, self-authoring mind, and transformational mind. And according to his research, the vast majority of adults are either stage three or in the three, four uh, transition, perhaps in stage four. And if you live long enough, you might hit level five. And I remember asking him in seminar, I was working with the assumption that the 19th century industrial model of education perpetuates socialized mind. And I asked him, did, did he have any views on that? And he said, uh, well, Julie, that's a researchable question which in academic parlance means we don't know, but you should look into it. So I, th I think this is critical. And so much of the great work that I see happening in schools, particularly in high schools, is helping those young people become much more self-authoring. What do you think? I was 23 and had gone through an entire system of education before a mentor asked me, what did I think? What did I actually think? So, what needs to change? I've noticed some themes, uh, and I'm, I'm using the terminology here, industrial and post-industrial. Some people use tra traditional, transformational, whatever the language is that sits with you. But essentially, we have this older system, and we're moving towards whatever it is that's going to come next. And typically, schools, for the most part, are grounded in these tenets time-based learning, teacher as expert and deliverer of content. And if we look at the post-industrial, in many cases, it's a 180-degree shift, where we're asking students to be much more self-directed. We're asking teachers to work in teams, interdisciplinary work, and to come together in a way that they might not have done so before. Uh, assessment. Assessment based on content assessment based on mastery, is a fundamentally different beast. And I think assessment right now is the Wild West of education. There's no valid or reliable instrument that I know of, for example, that can tell a seven-year-old where you are with regards to critical thinking. So we are actively building the field as we speak, which is so much of the part of why I do this work, which is I want you to do the work that's in your heart to do. Each of you will find yourselves gravitating towards different work here, and we need you to do the work that's in your heart to do. And I'm not saying that the left-hand side of the column is bad. Far from it. I have been the beneficiary of a beautifully timed lecture which answered a whole bunch of questions which helped me move forward. What I'm saying is the vast majority of schools are moving towards the right. 
So I'd like to give you just a few minutes now to check in with the neighbor at your table. When you look at these columns, what are the top one to three things that you're working on right now in your district? The top one to three things. Just take two minutes, do a quick pair share, and then we'll come back as a larger group. So a quick check in with your neighbor. What are some of the, the items that you're working on right now in your school or district? What are some of the priorities? Yes. Mm. Great, so strengths and interest-based learning for every student. You've probably read the Gallup data uh, that shows children's engagement levels in school, uh, which is 80%-ish kindergarten, and then plummets to 40-something percent by the end of high school. So if you could follow a child throughout their entire educational experience and their strengths and their interests, knowing that you don't want to laser in too quickly, you want to keep exposing them to as much as possible, but also knowing that there's something that you are really good at and uniquely good at. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, a teacher uh, called Jackie in South Carolina, and she talked about a kid uh, uh, she had who was just incredible talent uh, in engineering and math, a 10-year-old, and totally disorganized. Always forgot his homework, didn't bring the books. You know, sometimes he brought the backpack, sometimes he didn't. And she could see his confidence just really start to dwindle. And she kept him back after school one day, and she said, Scott, I am here to help you, and I'll work with your mom to help you get organized. You have got an incredible talent for engineering and for math. I don't know what you're going to do with it, but you need to follow that, str that strength and those interests. And here's the thing, Scott. There's this thing called an executive assistant. And he or she's going to take care of all of that organization for you. But right now, we need to set up a few systems and structures to help you. So that child didn't then, six months later, just mentally bail from the entire system thinking, I'm not smart, just because the organizational element wasn't there. What else? What else are you working on in your district? And check out Thrively if you haven't already. Check out Thrively. What else are you working on? Yes. Uh, real world and practical application. Yes. Let's get away from the game of school. Uh, I'm thinking again of a, a school in South Carolina next academy. And the founder there, Zach, said, why are we preparing children for the real world? They are in the real world. And the real world is where the lessons are. And if we can build that in and really make those classroom walls and that, those building walls porous, there's any learning opportunity you could want. Love that. What else? Ah, nice. Instead of asking you to fit into this box. I like that. I've often had this image in my mind's eye uh, of kids entering a school building early, these little technicolor individuals, and then they go through the system and they're grayed out versions of themselves by the time they, they come out the other end. Unless they have the talents and language logic and recall and can excel in that area. One last one. Belief Say it again. Belief and ah, belief systems and growth mindset. When I talk about the what's worth learning, uh, it's as much for the adults as it is for the students. And in my work with schools, the growth mindset is as much for the adults as it is for the students. Do you believe you can change? Do you believe that your colleagues can change? Do you believe that if you fail, that you're going to learn something, or that you're labeled a failure as a human being? Too often we make that, we make that direct leap. So this can be helpful as a faculty discussion document, start sparking conversation. And it also underscores the fact you can't do all of this at once. And in my experience, a lot of these elements are interdependent as well. So a helpful activity can be uh, just to take this slide, print copies, 
ask folks, where are we currently and where do you think we should be? Just put a little star where we are and a little uh, asterisk where you think we should be and get the lay of the land. A very helpful activity and then coming up with an action plan afterwards. So given what's worth learning, and given what needs to change, the big question is, how can transformation be enabled? I've noticed a, something has shifted in the last three to four years. When I first started this work about 10 years ago, I would, I would be chatting with people and I'd say, you know, we have this achievement gap and we have a much more insidious relevance gap. And in many ways, trying to close that achievement gap makes us double down and try to make more efficient a system that is obsolete. So we need to start building and nurturing the skills and knowledge of habits of mind that matter most. Things like creativity, collaboration, critical thinking, and so forth. That conversation has shifted in the last three to four years when I have it, where people say, yes, yes, Julie, we get that. That's hardly news. The big question is, how do we transform? How do we get from here to there? So I take uh, great courage and uh, just great hope from the fact that that conversation has changed. So how can it be enabled? There is a big cultural shift that needs to happen in order to support it. And I believe uh, to the core of my being that your culture will reflect your pedagogy and vice versa. So you can't have uh, learning that is student-based, that has a growth mindset, whilst having a compliance-driven culture. That pedagogy will not thrive in that culture. So this is the transition that I see happening, uh, that I see underway. So really moving from mitigating risk where possible. Let's be honest. Schools, for the most part, are based on knowing, grounded on knowing. I know my own educational experience, when the teacher asked you a question, the worst response you could have was, I don't know. And if you tried once, you sort of got one try, but if you tried two or three times, you were labeled a failure. So this whole focus on knowing needs to shift to learning. And again, this applies to the adults. Very early on in my career, I had a mentor who gave it to me straight, the way you do in Northern Ireland. And I remember I was in a meeting, and I wasn't saying a whole lot, and I could sense a whole lot of dysfunction going on, and I was thinking differently to the people in the group, and I just, I just you know, kept my mouth shut and went out of the meeting. And I remember Alan came up to me after the meeting, and he said to me, he said, Julie, what would you have said in that meeting if you didn't have the need to be smart and you didn't have the need to be liked? And that has stayed with me 20 years since. Am I trying to be the smartest person in the room? Am I trying to be invulnerable and show that I'm perfect and I know everything I'm talking about? And do I have a need for everybody to like me here? And uh, a resource I would highly recommend is Patrick Lencioni's The Five Dysfunctions of a, of a Team. And in that book, he talks about productive conflict. That conflict is not necessarily bad. Conflict is good. If you've got any more than two people involved in a conversation or a decision, there's going to be a difference of opinion. And it's important that that difference is shared and shared in a respectful and open and honest way. And he talks about the continuum of productive conflict in the middle. On the other end, you've got aggressive, unproductive conflict. And over here, you've got artificial harmony and I see way too much artificial harmony in schools, and also in higher ed as well. We're nice people. We're collegial. We like to get along. When I worked in higher ed, folks who'd moved from corporations used to say, I'm a corporate refugee. I wanted to go to a nice place to work. But the flip side of that is the artificial harmony and the need to really build a muscle around having those courageous conversations. There's also a lot more ambiguity. The system is structured uh, to be very process, system-oriented, uh, and with that come clear roles and responsibilities. And oftentimes, if a school is embarking on a large-scale change, the roles start to get ambiguous. And people are seeking clarity. And clarity might be premature. 
But of course, our brains don't like that. We're dealing with an amygdala hijack, the flight or fight response, which served us very well when we were cave men or cave women, and a saber-toothed tiger was coming at us. We didn't want to have to, you know, sit back and think, have I seen this tiger before? Is it a friendly tiger? Hmm. No. Either pick up your implement and fight the tiger or run in the opposite direction. And too often we're sitting in meetings and that exact same flight or fight response is happening. So there, there are different moments here uh, when courage is required. And the final element here, don't rock the boat. Moving to standing up when it is necessary in support of the vision. This is why I believe it's vitally important to bring your parents with you. If you bring them into the complexity of the work, help them understand the problem that the school is trying to solve. Get buy-in with the problem first. And then that enables you to push harder because you've got buy-in with the problem. I'd like to share now uh, five success factors for change. My caveat here is every school is different because every community is different. Some of these might apply to you, some might not. In my experience, though, if these five factors are in place, it helps increase the chance of success of your initiative. And some of these have already been mentioned in that first column with your input. First of all is that shared vision and the supportive and visionary school board. I've seen too many change initiatives fail because all it took was one or two influential parents to call somebody on the board for then that, that to be called off. And as a leader, you need the support of your board. I remember talking with one superintendent and his community had agreed that they were going to focus on the four C's. And he stood up in an auditorium uh, in front of 400 people and said, I can't guarantee level or increasing state test scores while we do this. We're going to have to start making some choices. If we're saying this is important, we need to value it over and above these test scores. Are you with me? And he eyeballed his board as well and asked the same question. That is a courageous move to make it that explicit. The shared vision of the change. Uh, before I go there, just a quick note on sustained leadership. You've probably read the statistics that the average tenure of a school superintendent is less than three years. And in my experience, this work takes anywhere from three to seven, if not 10 years, to really gain solid roots and to be sustainable and to be meaningful. So you need sustained leadership. And Revere is a great example of that. Sustained leadership over years. And if it transpires that the principal or the assistant principal or some of the key people, uh, the digital technology expert, when these people move on to other opportunities, it's incumbent that the hiring process really drives that North Star. That we're not going to come up with a whole bunch of new initiatives with a new superintendent or principal coming in. We have agreed this is it for the next five to seven years. And we will hire people who will move this vision forward. Unleashing talent and building teams. This is the bulk of my work. Whenever I'm working with a principal or a superintendent, I usually come in after the strategic plan has been, uh, has been crafted. And my first question is, it's usually a lovely plan. And then my next question is, where's the people development plan to make that thing work? Because when you look at the skills that are needed, there's often significant professional development needed over the long term to support and nurture these skills. If I'm a teacher and I've been teaching physics for five years, 10 years, 15 years, on my own in a classroom with a textbook, and you're asking me to coordinate and to co-teach, co-design with two other teachers in an interdis interdisciplinary project that has real-world application and to come up with a rubric that helps us really look at these different skills and knowledge of mind, you're taking me way outside of my comfort zone. And I will come up with 10 reasons as to why now is not a good time for me to do that. So understanding, and, and I mentioned this in the book, which is 
If you take nothing away from this book, please take this. Leading this kind of change is developmental work. It's adult developmental work. And I stand very strongly behind students first. And I also stand very strongly behind, if you're not helping the adults, it doesn't matter how loudly you say students, fir students first, you're not going to help them. Unless you're really focusing on the adults. What are their unique skills? What are their unique passions? How can you start to truly unleash that? What do they love to do? How can they bring that into the school? And some very simple things could get in your way, like your teacher evaluation process. That can literally put the brakes on your change initiative because teachers are being evaluated against a rubric which is not supportive of the overall vision of what it is that you're trying to do. The second piece is also helping folks work together in teams. And there are some very quick and easy workshop things to do to help establish you know, ground rules, coaching and feedback protocols to get folks up and running quickly. And these need to be put in place and they need to be nurtured. I'm thinking about a, a school I used to work with uh, in New Mexico. And the principal there, he got feedback from his teachers that they wanted time to work together. So he carved out 45 minutes at the start of the day, three days a week to help them do this because they were working in teams. And he said after the first month, he just walked by the room where they were all gathered and they had their heads down and they were grading papers. And I'm thinking of the comment at this side of the room about the inertia of the status quo and how the behaviors just snap back unless they are nurtured. Rethinking the use of time and space. The world is now the classroom. The resources that are available blow my mind. Both out in your community and across the globe. And I was working with a, a boarding school and they were a year into their, into their planning and there was a collective uh, comment started to come up from the group. You know, we don't have time, we don't have time. And, and the principal was starting to lose it a little bit and he said, are you kidding me? We're a boarding school. They're with us 24 hours a day. We have all the time. Let's, let's park the current schedule and let's totally rethink this. Now as public schools, for the most part, you're dealing with some significant structures. I'm, not going to Pollyanna it, you have challenges there. And that time can be reconfigured. Oh, and then just, you know, by the way, completely overhauling the assessment structure. <laughs> and as I mentioned, that's the Wild West right now. There's incredibly exciting, happen exciting work happening uh, in, that, in that space. Has anybody heard of the Mastery Transcript Consortium? Raise your hand. A few folks, oh, quite a few folks, great. Uh, this was started by independent schools. Uh, but their broader mission is to transform high school. And Scott Looney, who was one of the founders of the Mastery Transcript, uh, I believe he stood up at NIS, gave a presentation, and almost in tears said, we are killing our kids. How many more APs and extracurriculars can they shove into a college admissions application before we say enough? The college admissions process is the tail that's wagging the dog. We need to claim what we know these adolescents need and the skills and knowledge and habits of mind and figure out a way to assess how they're doing and how we can show colleges their potential and their growth over time. And they're starting to do much more uh, public-private partnership. I think that's incredibly innovative and exciting work. Secondly, the Assessment for Learning project from EDUCAUSE. Uh, I think they started that work maybe three years ago, and I loved their initial uh, outreach to the community. They didn't put an RFP out there, they put an RFL, which was explicit, a request for learning. Being humble enough to say, we don't know, the field doesn't know, but we can figure it out together. Educators can work together to figure this out. And if you're accepted under this grant, the deal is you will learn with your colleagues. So we don't actually want grant submissions that say this is currently working well and we'd like to grow it. We want grant submissions to say, here are my big questions and I haven't yet figured this out. 
So again, uh, tremendous potential there. And I'll double down for just a moment on assessment. The Crossing the Chasm model, you might have seen this before, it's uh, from a book uh, by Jeffrey Moore. And in that book, he wanted to uh, dig into and identify why is some technology adopted by the masses and other technology is not. And there's a chasm, a chasm that needs to be bridged in order to be adopted by the masses. So I read that book through the lens of how might a more progressive model of education be adopted by the broader educational system? And in my mind, Piaget, Furbel, Montessori, Steiner, you could take it back to Socrates, the innovators. Montessori, for example, she was a scientist. She observed children, how they learn. And then you've got schools like the High Tech High, the New Tech Network, Da Vinci schools, that have taken that and really built on it. But there exists a chasm between the early adopters and the early majority. And one of the biggest distinctions between that early adopter and the early majority is their appetite for risk. So an innovator or an early adopter will do it precisely because it hasn't been done before. Precisely because they don't know how it's going to turn out. Because if I knew how it was going to turn out, why bother? That's boring. The early majority, on the other hand, they need proof. They need proof that it works and that it works in my specific context. Which is why I implore you, if you're doing any work in assessment, keep doing it. If you start to work on the rubrics, investigate what's out, already existing out there and how you can continue to build on that. Uh, I did some research, this was back in 2015. I interviewed 27 thought leaders and asked them what were some of the trends, what were some of the biggest challenges, and where are the bright points of light. And that's a report which is downloadable uh, from my website, and that link will be in the final, final slide here. So I encourage you to download that. And uh, we also built an open source database where folks very kindly forwarded their rubrics and what they're already using. And that's an open source database, again, from the website, and you'll see that link at the end as well. So I encourage you to take that and build on it. This needs to be built with educators. We can't have policy people in DC making decisions about how we're going to start assessing critical thinking. Oh. OK, another tool uh, to put in your toolbox. About eight or nine years ago, uh, when I first started this work with schools, I kept coming up against something that I couldn't quite put my arms around. That the general confusion that happens in a school or district when we're going through change. There's something happening there, and I, I couldn't quite put my arms around it, and I couldn't put language to it. And then I read this article by Bruno and Kerber out of Bentley College, and this put a language and a framework around something I couldn't, I couldn't get my arms around. So when it comes to change, there, according to this, uh, this research, there are three different kinds of change. And if we look at these axes, the, uh, the vertical is organizational complexity. That one's fairly uh, self-explanatory. The horizontal axes, socio-technical uncertainty, that speaks to the extent to which the processes, structures, systems, and people are known and understood to get it done. So you can see something like, how do we assess critical thinking? That's on the far right hand of that particular axis. So let, let's take some examples here. Uh, the three types of change. First one is direct change. So if, if I make the decision we're going to change the physics textbook from version 4.0 4 to 5.0, that's pretty easy. Not a whole lot of complexity, a lot, lot of certainty with regards to how I might implement that, put a nice communication plan around it, done. The next one is planned change. And this is when you bring the community together and start to talk about what is it that we need to do differently. And I believe schools do a really good job of planned change. They're the victim of directed change uh, too often, and they do a really good job of planned change, which is bringing folks together, asking them what they think, getting consensus, distilling input, really coming up with, okay, this is what we, the community, want. 
Where I think there's an incredible opportunity is the third kind of change, which is iterative changing. And this was the piece that I couldn't get my arms around until I read the article, which is this is emergent. And you don't really know it ahead of time. Oftentimes in schools, we, we go through anywhere from a one to two year period to come up with the strategic plan. And then there, I've noticed there's this assumption that somewhere on the superintendent's hard drive or in the cloud, there's an Excel spreadsheet that says how all of this is going to happen. There's a nice Gantt chart which has workflows and a three-year plan and pull this lever and do this and do this and do this. That doesn't and shouldn't and can't happen for this kind of work, this kind of cultural change. It is much more improvisational. You're trying stuff out, you're seeing what works, you're learning as you go, and you're doing so in community. This is why the top-down doesn't work. It has to be top-down, bottom-up, inside-out, and outside-in. This is what makes it complex. And if we break these down, you can see how, how they differentiate from each other. And what I would love to see in the next decade is schools to become much more familiar with this kind of language, to give each other a break. That we're involved in a, basically an iterative design process. I think this is why design thinking has really taken off in schools. Iterative changing is design thinking. It's all about getting your minimum viable product up there, testing it, and, and, and working in those rapid design cycles. And this also speaks to the pace of change. So during plan change, you're going slow. You're making sure you've got the buy-in. And once you've got the buy-in, trying those things quickly. Not having three meetings about the meeting before you try something. <laughs> and then, of course, the real meeting happens outside the room anyway. So we've just lost an entirety of 10 hours there. But get people involved and get people doing the work on the ground. Now, there's also a bit of a rub here. And again, I don't want to put a Pollyanna sheen on it. People don't want to be told what to do. And sometimes people just want to be told what to do. And I'm thinking about a superintendent out in California. Uh, he came to work at a district that had previously had a lot of micromanaging at the most senior levels. And people were fearful of and they were all men, men coming in in suits with clipboards to check off where the objectives on the board, was this in the classroom? It was a checklist driven uh, system. And he said it didn't take him any more than you know, six weeks of his listening to her to say, okay, we're gonna stop doing that. And we're gonna stop focusing on the tests. And we're gonna start giving the teachers autonomy. And he thought, but once he shared all of that, that it was done. But six weeks later, he's going around those same classrooms and the teachers are teaching in the same way. Thank you. And what he realized was, sometimes you can open the cage of the industrial system and sometimes you have to reach a hand in and help, help the person out. Thank you, Anne. Five minutes, let me skip forward and I'm glad we have a Q&A at the end. Uh, I'll skip through this and get into this during the Q&A. But I didn't want to end uh, without sharing this. This work is a marathon, not a sprint. When you've got your strategic plan, you haven't finished the race, that's given you permission to go to the starting line. You're at the starting line. You now have to run a marathon to implement that change. And I just came from a trip from Northern Ireland and met with a number of folks there doing incredible work. And I shared this model, and a woman came up to me at the end, and she made an addition, which I love, and I need a new graphic. She said, Julie, I used to think of it as a marathon. I now think of it as a relay. This is generational work. And sometimes on those days when I feel entirely demotivated, did the last six months mean anything? Have I had any impact? I think... This is generational work. I am passing the baton to whomever is coming behind me. And I love that frame of a relay. And I'd like you to think now about your own work. Anybody familiar with the hero's journey? 
Joseph Campbell, a few folks. Great. Think about your own work. This is the shift from the known world to the unknown world. What is your call to adventure? What is the change that you would like to see either in your classroom, in your school, in your community, in the system writ large? What is the change that you would like to see? Park for a nanosecond whether or not you think you can actually do it. Just park it. What is that? I'd like you to share that over lunch. So that's my little call to action. Over lunch, ask two people what their call to adventure is. Because I hate networking, and I always like something to do. So if you're like me, that's something to do. Uh, and also to meet some new people as well. The minute you can think of that, that's the minute all of the reasons why you can't and you shouldn't and you're not qualified and it's been done before and why should I bother? That's the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. That's your reptilian brain trying to keep you in the safe zone. But then what happens is you meet the mentor. It might either be your inner mentor, that other part of you that knows better and can calm down that inner critic, or it might be somebody external in your school, outside of your school, who says, well, why don't you give it a go? Let me help you. I can introduce you to some people. And in that moment, you start to take action, and you cross from the known world to the unknown world. And that's when you start to meet not only your challenges, but also your tribe. And I can tell you from experience, the minute you, make, you take that scary leap, it's amazing the people you will find and who will help you. You need them, and they need you. They need you. The challenge, of course, is on this path, you're going to meet your demons. And part of the challenge of the path is we like to think that we want to build the skills before we start. The deal is you don't build the skills until you're on the path. And I remember when I was writing the book, and I had so many dark nights of the soul with the book. And I thought I was writing a book just to distill you know, what I was thinking. But what really happened was I was writing the book to get really clear on what I believe and to stand behind that and to not give two hoots what the Amazon reviews say. I, um, I used to live in fear of the Amazon zero or one star review, and this woman doesn't know what she's talking about. Still working on it, if I'm honest. But that can't dictate your decisions. It can't dictate your life. And once you go into that dark place, I mean, my question when I first started writing the book was how to change the education system. I mean, that's a pretty arrogant question to be asking yourself. You know, did I, Julie Wilson, really think that I could come up with an answer to that? Really. But what I realized was, as I dug into this, A, there's no silver bullet, but B, and, and this I believe, and this is why I wrote the book, I believe that if every single person on this planet who has an idea to change the education system took action on it, we would unleash a tidal wave of change. If every single person took action, I'm not saying you have to be successful or you know, get to the end of it, but the very, the very fact that you start to take action leads you to what's next, which might be something entirely different to what you could have conceived and even better. But what's vital is that you take that step from the known world to the unknown world. And if you do that, not only are you living your own purpose, but you're being that model for others, that generational relay, the people who will come behind you. Models like High Tech High and New Tech weren't possible unless Furble and Steiner and Montessori and Piaget and Dewey did their work. So what will not be possible if you don't do your work? And there will never be another you who has your experience, who has your questions, who has that drive, who has just the community, the place in which you find yourself. Your capacity to act is far greater than we oftentimes believe it to be. So over lunch, ask two people, what is their call to adventure? And then ask them, 
How can I help? Because this work is done in a tribe. Do not try to lead change on your own. This work is done in a tribe. And when somebody asks you, how can I help? Don't say what our knee-jerk reaction is, which is, I'm fine. I think if we were more vulnerable and said, well, this is what I'm struggling with, that that's the next level, where we really start to come together as a community and help each other. So thank you for having me here today. I'm really looking forward to the Q&A afterwards. Heed your call to adventure. Thank you.